So we're going to get started, and we're going to have to project a little until somebody from the AV squad shows up to turn on the uh, sound system, because if I touch it, there'll be an electrocution, and that's not what we're here to talk about. That's true. <coughs> well, it would, it would be make for an interesting panel. Make for an interesting story, and that's what we're here to talk about, good yeah. stories and storytelling and storytelling structure. Great and segue. I did, yeah. Well, he'd be a writer. <laughs> I asked these people to join me on the stage because, one, they're people whose work I've enjoyed as a reader over the years, but they also bring a wide variety of experiences to writing because they've written for comics, novels, video games, animation, uh, live action. As a result, they can bring a, a wealth of experience beyond the four-color page uh, and make it a much more enriching discussion. So. Real brief, let's see if we can do the introductions briefly and get into the, the meat of the matter. Um, my far left, why don't you identify yourself for the audience? My name is Mark Wade. I've written a bunch of comics like everybody else up here. Um, that's, uh, currently I'm working on Archie, Avengers, Champions, a bunch of stuff for Marvel. Uh, to my right. That's you. That's me, <laughs> Elliot Magan, how are you? Um, I've also written a bunch of comics and stuff. <laughs> it's this, uh, uh, predominantly as an editor, but I've also been a, a writer of uh, prose and co of history and fiction and such. Okay, I've written, I've edited comics, I've written comics, I've written books, I've written weird animation things that you will have never seen. Um, so I guess that's it. Marv? Yeah, but did, yeah, but did, did you own a store? Oh, I'm Louise Simonson, sorry. Yeah, but did you own a store? I did never own well, a store. You then, own a store. There you go. <laughs> I, um, I have a hundred pairs of I'm also <laughs> been, uh, writing all those stuff. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I'm James Tynan the Fourth. I'm the writer of Detective Comics, Batman, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, um, and a whole lot of other comics that a lot of them have Batman in it, and a few of them don't. But yeah. <laughs> all right. So before we get into the structure, the actual building of a good story. What makes a good story? What makes a successful story in any medium? Okay. Um, I, what makes a story for me is I, I'm interested and want to read it. I'm engaged. I enjoy the characters. I want to spend some time with them. And that seems to be, you know, there's a lot of things that go into that, but that seems to be essentially for me, that's it. You know, they have to be characters I want to spend time with. Right. I want to see what happens in their lives. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, I agree. My answer would be that I have, it's hard. That's what it has to be in a story as far as I'm concerned. A, a, the basic definition of a story, at least for me, is somebody wants something, something's in his, in his way. And there is some sort of resolution after they either they get it or they don't get it. And if you're not interested in who that person is, then the rest of the story falls apart. You don't care. The, the, silly, the silliest question I ever get is, is where do you get your ideas? And I have no idea. But I used to tell people, I used to tell people there were only seven or eight plots, and I was incorrect. There was only one. Yeah. Um, and the success of it is twofold. One, whether you understand the way the decision, conflict and resolution fit together, and the other is what you bring to it, what you bring personally to it, which is what Mark was talking about, about heart. Uh, if you got it, you got it. If you don't, it's not going to work. The, everything is about character. Uh, we don't care about a chair. We care about the person who makes the chair or delivers the chair or sells the chair or who buys the chair. It's all about who the people are and what problem they're trying to solve and how they go about it. And you have to make the readers care about the characters. Uh, because there's truly nothing else. By the time you've read your fifth comic, you've read most plots or fight scenes. So it's all about the characters. And nobody comes up to me and said, that was a great fight scene in, in some comic I read you know, 32 years ago. It's, I really love what happened to a character there. So that's what makes a good story. So how do we achieve that? How, where do we start? Do we start with the chair? Or do we start with a theme, a character, a setting? I mean, where do we, what's our starting point as writers? Pick a, pick a person, because we can't Tell see down there and we, they yeah. can't see us, so, so pick a person. James. Oh. Uh, yeah, so I would say that it, it depends on the story. Uh, there are stories that I start with a really 
firm idea of what the of who a character is and where they're going and all of that. And then I have sometimes I start very uh, you know from an aerial view of the plot and I see the, how the plot works and then I realize wh how the character would shape themselves in the face of that plot and how they would uh, build from it. Um, it. It really it really depends on uh, like on on the st it's story to story for me so far. Um, yeah, uh, every 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 story is going to come in a different fashion. Sometimes you may come up with a title. Uh, sometimes it may just be a visual, uh, maybe a character uh, character point that you suddenly go, "Oh my God, I never thought of that before." You just never know where it's coming from. The trick is not only to be open to those ideas that are coming into you, but also how to turn an idea into an actual story. Uh, having an idea is not enough. It's all. How is it going to work? How are the characters going to be affected? What are the surprises that you're going to give to the reader along the way that makes them want to continue because they don't know where it's going to go? I think for me the sea crystal is why. Um, you know, why somebody wants something, that's important. And then why they can't have it, that's important. And when you know the why they want it and why they can't have it, then it from that you've got the blocks to what they need. And sometimes they need things on two levels. Sometimes what they need physically is not what they need emotionally. So it's really fun if you can get those going in opposite directions. They, 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 they desperately need something physically that they shouldn't have emotionally. And that, that really wrenches characters' hearts. And the ones you torture the best, you love the best. I'm just saying. Yeah, my favorite character was always Luther, because I could torture him. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I identified with him. How so? Was, well, on my best days, I was Lex for like an hour and a half at a time. You know, I could I could focus. I could be smart. I could have something working through me uh, to make a to make a, a story work together. And then it would go away. I mean, Lex was Lex all the time. But uh, every once in a while, I got the feeling I could be him. <laughs> Where my my system is backwards and nothing I would recommend to anybody in this room. <laughs> the way that I found that I start stories and, and look, at, it's not, I don't look for theme first. I don't really even look for character first. That will come as I start thinking about stuff. But picture like an upside down jigsaw puzzle. And the way that I tend to approach it is I think of an idea for a moment or a scene or a, a line of dialogue that somebody can say and I turned over that piece, and then another thing, and then another, and before I know it, the pieces start connecting. I see how you could connect these things together. And once I have some momentum there, then I, then I start to structure it out. Well, here's the ending I want. Here's the beginning I want. And I, yeah, I, I went on about character a minute ago, but that this is with the caveat that I already know who the characters are going into the story, and I know them intimately. So building on that, I kind of the caring about them comes automatically. So, since, the major, since everyone on the day is here has written serialized fiction, you've already got the characters established. So, are you looking around at what you've done in previous years or, pre, or your predecessors and found some nugget to, to build off of? Um, some, some nagging thread, maybe? Yeah, I mean, uh, the. The way I've always talked about it, like particularly uh, with a character like Batman, uh, was I kind of view every every single comic issue, every single sh time he's shown up on a TV show or in a movie or all of that. It's sort of like a, a different dot on a, like on a like big graph, and it's just from different personalities. And somewhere at the heart of that is the real personality of Batman. And that shifts from time to time. And I focus on the stories that that have always kind of that, that have shaped my understanding of the character uh, to to uh, give give him voice. Um, and like for for me, my my Batman's always going to have the voice of Kevin Conroy. Uh, and if I can't like if if uh, if I'm writing an action sequence that I can't play the. Um, the, the particularly the choral version of the theme fr of the Batman animated series theme uh, from Mask of the Phantasm. If an action sequence can't have that like playing behind it, it's not a Batman action sequence. <laughs> um, so it's like a, there, I, I do try to tap into 
something at the heart of it, but it, at the end of the day, uh, I try to rely on the stories that I've always loved the most. And there are definitely always, there are people who think that my interpretations of the characters are therefore wrong because they have a different set of, of priorities with those characters. But uh, I think most stories, particularly with superheroes, especially the stories that really sit with you, speak to the core of that character. Uh, so you can come at them from a lot of different ways. <coughs> with, um, go ahead, Mark. You were about to say. Uh, yeah, you, uh, I try when possible to find a new wrinkle on a character that we haven't uh, seen before. Those are very hard to do because uh, some of these characters have been around for 75, 80 years. Uh, but even a character that, say, I created, like Raven for the Titans uh, 37 years ago. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, and I'm doing a mini series, and it's uh, Raven was o always started. Her story always started with the fact that her mother ran away from home and uh, did it with a demon. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, I never, when I'm trying to uh, work out the new Raven mini series, it suddenly struck me why did her mother run away from home? We never dealt with that before, so it's moving into the past and realizing what that ha why she did this, how it affected her, and then therefore what her family life was like before Raven was around. So you always can find some wrinkle about a character uh, that allows you to find to create a new story around a long-running character. It's harder with Superman and Batman, but those are actually some of the most fun stories to write because you have to use your you really have to think about it. You have to go, what is totally important to this character that we haven't seen before? And we know the characters well enough that we somehow find it a lot of the time, not all the time. Do you find it challenging then to, to come up with a conflict for these well-established characters that, that feels fresh? <coughs> not, not necessarily. I mean, what I tend to do, and I can't speak for anybody in the panel, although I'd be interested to hear other people on the panel's response is, rather than read a thousand Wonder Woman comics, which I probably have actually, but that's <laughs> not my point, I've done whatever research I can, I, I, my big thing is going back to ground, going back to, the, like, if I'm taking over Daredevil, I go read the earliest Daredevil stories. I'm a, I'm a huge believer in author intent. Go back to look at the early Batman stories. Go back to look at the early Captain America stories and find what's there because... And you never went to law school. Well, I never went to law school. I, <laughs> except for Superman where I go back to whatever Elliot did. But <laughs> Because I, cause what I find is that, especially with these long-running characters, there is a reason that these characters have been around longer than any of us have been alive. Even Mark. And <laughs> Thank you, Mark. Uh, <laughs> there's... <laughs> And there's a reason they've been alive. And if you think you can, first, but nobody quite knows what it is. If everybody knew what that X factor was, we would all be creating characters that would last 100 years. So go back, immerse yourself in the early stuff, see if you can figure out what the kinds of things that made it eternal, the kind of things that made these characters last as long as they have, and try to, just try to find it in there. That's, at least that's, that's my approach when it comes to you said coming up with new wrinkles. Right. I like that. Thank you. No, I mean, really, uh, the, the stories, the characters that work least are those that the writers try to change the most. Yeah. Um, if you go back to what the character was when you were a kid, and, and you try to extrapolate it into you know, the real world or the, the present or something, it, it, that's the way it works. Um, if you, Try to make Superman a guy who snaps people's necks. Well, no, that's not going to work. But you don't say. <laughs> <laughs> I just wanted to get that. In. Yeah. <laughs> he says that at every pack. Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, please. You go back to 1938. Right. Superman was much tougher yes. back then and less forgiving. And I know when I went back, when I was on Superman, uh, when I was allowed to, I went back to those 38 stories and brought them up to date. Right. Mm -hmm. So you'd have a character that had a little bit more grit but than we had been seeing. Hmm? The times were more in it. And that was what I was going to say, is your character's interacting with the environment. It's what they're, what they're right. talking about, so I've said my bit now. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I, think we're in violent, I think we're in violent agreement. 
I do. Yeah. I do. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Our heating heated agreement. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> let's get back to the structure for a second. You've got the beginnings of your story. You've got a couple of restrictions. You've got a 20 page finite limit. Plus, more often than not, it continues into the next issue, possibly for five or six months so it can get collected. So, at what point, you know, when you've got your idea, at what point do you guys say, all right, this is good for two or three issues, or this is all done in one. I mean, how, how do you evaluate that? I mean, I'm, I'm definitely very interested in how, how the, the amazing talent on this panel does it, because I'm still figuring it out. Um, but the way, that, uh, the way that I've built uh, a lot of my stories is I sort of, I have, I have multiple documents on my computer, and one document is sort of, uh, is, I call it, it's the big idea document. And it's the one that uh, all of my crazy, like, 20-page emails that I send my editors with ideas for future storylines and all of that, how uh, threads that I'm bringing up now could be paid off way down the line and all that. It's, I dump it all in there. Uh, and I try to, based on that, kind of structure it into, uh, like, how, how the story's going to progress. How, is, this is particularly with how I write detective comics because I kind of knew I had a long uh, runway uh, with the series. And, uh, and then in that, I sort of realized that in between these arcs, there, there needs to, like some, a character needs to move a, a bit forward and that's why like, it, I, need, I need the character be, to be in a different place emotionally before we get to this story down the line. And then I create the, the, the more bottle story that focuses on that character, or I take a, take a scene from much later on and put it uh, further, uh, further up. And then honestly, those big idea documents, I end up throwing out half of it, but it's just like, it's the, it is the destination point that I am shooting towards, and the destination changes uh, over the course of telling the story. But I, 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 re I need, in order to keep moving forward, to know what I'm kind of driving towards. Uh, but I'm not, you know, like I'm. I, I don't ah, need to land well there. Done. Oh, there we go. There was sound, Hello, and it was good. <laughs> <laughs> okay, amazing talent. Well, how did you do? Oh, well, you know, it makes a difference, I guess, as to what for me is what does the character need and what can they have, and sometimes, I mean, I like a conflict and a resolution in every yeah. in every story. Um, every every issue, although you can have minor conflicts and resolutions that build toward a climax. Um, so you know, sometimes it's as simple as they want you to do a three issue arc, so that you say, well, I can finish this in three issues. <laughs> right. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, I think that you can make a story as complex or as simple as it needs to be for a specific length. I know these days a lot of people work for a length, don't they? Yes. Because yeah. the things are going to be collected. Right. So it's like six issue arts is generally what people, five or six issues. Five or six issues, that people are working fits in a trade paperback, yeah. Yeah. Um, Until the omnibus. But, um, yeah. Right, that's true. Back in the day, you know, I would do things that were, you know, single issues or double issues or sometimes three issues in a row. So, you know, I just, it was what, whatever the story needed back when I had the option of choosing on okay. my own. So when you had that, when you had that option, anybody here, you know it's going to be a three or a six issue arc. How do you make each individual section stand apart enough to satisfy your reader so they'll come back the following month and pluck down his four bucks for the next issue? Well, I think Weezy had the answer, which is that not, not, that, not, that you, not that I'm accusing you of a bad question. I think Weezy had the right answer, which is that there needs to be a conflict and a resolution in every issue. Even if it's a, you know, a little, you're taking a little subplot and you're tying them off. A little, a little character moment that you set up earlier, these two characters are in conflict in the first part of the story. Like, Avengers is an example. I'll do a three-issue Avengers story, but in the first issue, these two characters are in conflict, Thor and Falcon. I'm pulling stuff out of the air. But by the end of that issue, they come together on, on whatever that smaller issue is, but it's still, but Kang is still punching the world. So it's, it's there's your example, so you can go on to the next part of your big arc. Well then, since you brought up the Avengers and most everyone here is writing team books and stuff like that, what are the complications in writing a larger ensemble like that as opposed to just Batman or Superman? Well, the beauty of it, not the, not the difficulty of it, 
is that you get to explore a lot of characters. Sometimes, if it's a single character, you have to keep searching for whatever's going to motivate them into the next issue, if it's a multiple plot story or something like that. With a group, you have the interaction between the characters. And the fact is, the best way of handling that for me is find what they disagree with. Even if they're the closest of friends, if they're lovers, it doesn't matter. You're going to find points of disagreement. And out of the disagreement comes the drama. And that's the points that you play with. Uh, you find what's going to make it the most difficult for them. Uh, why one person who totally <coughs> believes something is in conflict with another character who totally believes something. They heated agreement. Yeah. We all agree on the end result, but how to get there. Right. And that <coughs> allows you not only to tell a more interesting story, you learn more about the individual characters because they have to express <coughs> why they care about something in a certain way, why they want to go about it in a certain fashion. So when you do that, you're building character and you're building drama. Okay. Mark, can you compare writing... No. Oh, sorry. No, sorry. But can you compare writing your two sets of teens, your champions and your Archie world? You know, yeah. You know, from a structural standpoint, you know, how do you do that? It's, it's oddly, it's the same structure. Yeah, okay. It That's is. Fine. It is finding my favorite thing to do, and the thing that sparks a lot of stories is you find two characters who don't normally share the same space, who who seem ideologically, you know, to, to back to Mark, seem ideologically opposed, or at least just why would these characters hang out? If you put Jughead and Veronica in a story, just the two of them, I have no idea what they have in common, but I'm going to find out if I put, you know, if I put Hulk and the Vision in the story together, I have no idea. What but let's find out, and it comes as you type. It comes as you think about the character. Okay. When when I when I started Titans, and I, well, I talk about this at uh, writing seminars when I do them, I actually created a chart where all the names of the characters are across the top and on down the side, so that you'd have like, what does Raven think of Starfire? Oh, okay. All the private thoughts. What she actually thinks about this other character, and then on the next page would be what Starfire thinks of Raven, because. As you know from your friends, sometimes you have a certain view of a person, but they may have a completely different view of you. So as you start to piece together all the things about what, what they think about the other character, or what the characters think about them, you already start to create real people. You create people that have emotions and create people that are going to uh, keep tangling with you and make it a little bit harder to get past certain things and you worry. Uh, you I'm not explaining it well, but I hope you understand. The idea is find the points, as Mark said, that are similar and, the dif and different, and milk them, and keep playing with them and finding it, so that when you get to the multiple teams, like seven characters in a book, you're really creating a lot of conflict. Yeah, when I was writing Legion of Superheroes, it was, it was you know, it was shooting fish in a barrel, because there's 25 of them. Yep. So you put any two of them together and see what you get. Wait, Elliot? The, the, the closest we've come to the bone here in terms of story structure is that everything has to have a res resolution, some satisfying thing that, that you arrive at when you're hearing the story. It can support any point of view at all, whether it's true or false or ridiculous, with three sentences. <coughs> if the first sentence is a decision, the second is a conflict, the third is a resolution. Or the first sentence is a, is a statement, the second is an explanation, the third is an illustration. Decision, conflict resolution, subject, predicate, object, uh, act one, act two, act three, synthesis, antithesis, and I'm sorry, I'm backwards. <laughs> Thesis, synthesis, antithesis. Everything works the same way. The whole world is based on fractal structures, triangles, things leading on each other. And even a cliffhanger at the end of a, of a, of a, of a part of a story is a resolution because you've gotten to a point where you want to go to the next story. Yeah. Um, when, when you don't have those three elements in a story, your readers will construct them themselves. And if you don't put them there, they'll be the wrong ones. <laughs> in every case, pretty much. And, and I didn't understand any of this stuff when I was writing comics full time. I was in my 40s, I figured out, wait a minute, all of those things are the same story and where they aren't, those are the stories that didn't work. And there were a lot of those. <laughs> so, you all, 
in my introduction, I talked about the fact that you all have written beyond comic books. Um, <coughs> those same lessons apply to a video game, or uh, in your case, the prose novels, and or a sentence, or a sentence, or an idea. Ideas are real things. They all have decisions, conflicts, and resolutions. Right. They're real. They're just like your pet, or the planet, or the sun. An idea is a thing. It fits into our four-dimensional world. Same way anything else does. Yeah, so an idea, everything has those three pieces. Okay. And every piece has three pieces. And every piece of that has, you know what I mean? <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> I get it. Yeah. So, Elliot's panel on the Trinity will be scheduled for next year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so, we talked about the, the multi-issue arcs and all. Do you guys miss writing shorter works, done uh, ones? I desperately miss uh, writing the shorter works. I, I did Bullseye earlier this year, and it was great to do a ten-page story. But when I when I edited myself, I made the stories as long as I wanted. So uh, my first Night Force story was eight and a half issues. Okay. It couldn't be expanded to the full issue, so I started the next story in the last 10 pages of the first book. Or it was a Titan story that ran about two thirds of the issue, and then I put a, sep a secondary story in. I think stories should run as long as that story needs to run. And the fact that you sometimes have to do six parters or something means you have to work a lot harder to come up with all the twists and turns for six parts, and you have to make sure it's worth six parts. James, you mentioned you know, the, the battle story is part of within your larger arc. Um, do you want to write more battle stories? Do you, do you, you, know, you haven't done a lot of these. Yeah, ones. Things. I uh, like I haven't is, I haven't done a lot of my current uh, the stuff I'm currently writing. But where I uh, started was uh, I, I like my, I started doing backup stories on Batman. That, that was my first. Uh, uh, that, that's how I broke in. So I, I started on these eight-page stories, and then sometimes they were eight-page stories, and then uh, Scott Snyder and Greg Capullo would need an extra two pages, and then they had to be six-page stories, um, which was a lot of fun uh, compressing after I'd written. But uh, the like those stories really helped me uh, figure out pacing um, because it was sort of yeah. uh, how do you how do how do you create something compelling in uh, in a in just an eight page short, particularly the the second arc, uh, which was it was a big Joker story that Scott was uh, telling, uh, Death of the Family, uh, like and this was and the the backup stories were just basically these little shorts with uh, a Joker going and kind of recruiting different members of uh, Batman's rogues gallery. And it was just these little kind of, and the way that Scott and I spoke about them beforehand, and this is what I took into it, is it's sort of like the devil showing up in each scenario and kind of speaking to like this glorious part of them that they don't see, but the Joker sees it in them. And it's saying that you can embody this and become this more frightening, more powerful version if you, if you approach it my way. Um, and, uh, you know, through the layer of the Joker and, you know, so I also, in that storyline, uh, I uh, made Jock draw an, a, a horse held upside down and he said he wanted to kill me after that. So that was uh, a lot of fun. But There's something about or artists and horses. I've, I've had artists oh, say, yeah, I'll no. draw anything but a horse. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but uh, I love those stories. I have more stories like that I want to tell. Uh, I don't get to do them often enough, and especially uh, now that we're doing uh, like detectives bi-weekly. So there have been a like there's been a one shot. There's been a two part. There have been a, a couple of two parters and all of that. But it's the those stories tend to be the ones that I have to bring in a co-writer for or something to loosen up my schedule. Um, so I, I actually don't get to sit down and enjoy. Uh, the the nice little bottle episode. The um, there's one coming up that I'm very excited about uh, in uh, January. That I, I like. I basically was just like, I know I do not have room in my schedule for this, but I am writing it. Like I'm not farming this out. I want I want to be able to do a done in one story. As writers, do you get differing demands from your or requests from your different publishers about the kinds of stories you write or? lengths or you know, any guidelines that, that 
to help differentiate one publisher from another? Well, let's let Elliot speak to that because Elliot, speak, <laughs> Elliot spoke with one of the most controlling but wonderful editors in all of comics. He yeah. did, didn't he? Yes. Yeah, really controlling. What was your, what was your process with Julie? I would come in with an idea, a, gen, a germ of an idea. I would say, I want to do a story about Mel Brooks. And he would throw his hands in the air and we would hash it out. It would take about two hours and nobody took any notes. All right. And I would go home and write the story. And we would have blocked it out in some detail. I'd come back with a completely different story.